good um, afternoon, everyone. Um, so we are moving on to this uh, final um, parallel session with three very interesting uh, papers today. Um, and relative to the previous contribution, we're going from a regional national uh, approach uh, to looking at more international and supranational dimension with a specific focus on technologies. All of the three papers look at uh, technology issues. Um, the focus of this session is analyzing new energy policy and regulation, uh, as, as I was saying, on an international level. Our first contribution today is from Yang Siu Lu from Oxford University um, with um, uh, other collaborators that I'm sure she'll uh, remind us about. And um, the topic of her presentation is could technologies reduce the risk of fossil fuel assets being stranded in the power sector? So. Uh, I remind the speakers that they have 12 minutes for their presentation and the participants that they can send questions through the chat box that we will either relate to our presenters or pass on to them after the session is completed. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Yang Xiu, if you could uh, give your presentation first. Yes, um, thank you very much. So uh, I think while waiting for my slides to appear, uh, I would just firstly introduce myself. So um, I am Yang Xu, a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford. And the paper I'm going to present is a joint work um, of my, uh, with my colleagues from the University of Oxford and also um, University of Barcelona. So in this paper, we are going to look at how the low carbon and the negative emission technologies could play the role in reducing the asset stranding in the power sector. So uh, could I have the next slide, please? And I'll start with the motivation. So the motivation for this paper um, comes from the increase of the fossil fuel power plants in recent years. As you can see on the screen here, uh, we show the distribution of the global coal power plants in 2020. And you could see, despite the climate urgency status, uh, still a lot of coal power plants are being constructed and planned, um, especially they are concentrated in Asian countries. So on the one side, we see this um, increasing of fossil fuel power plants. And in the next slide, uh, we see that there are also scientists warning us that the emissions from existing fossil fuel power plants already go beyond the carbon budgets, which are consistent with the Paris Agreement. So, which means if we are able, if we are aimed to attain these uh, climate targets, then some of these fossil fuel power plants could not be run as they are planned to, or they have to retire early. And this signals the issue of stranded assets, so which are defined as fossil fuel assets that may suffer from premature write downs, devaluations, or conversion to lights. So um, I'm pretty sure that here is also is, is quite familiar with the literature of stranded assets. And what what we did is one step further. We look at um, how the technologies could play a role here in um, in reducing such risk. So in the next slide, um, we see some of the stakeholders um, are biting on low carbon and negative emission technologies. So some of the fossil fuel companies, as you can see here, they are actively investing in technologies like carbon capture and storage or bioenergy offsites. So the reason behind this is for CCS, it could prevent emissions from going to the atmosphere, and bioenergy could absorb CO2. And if we combine these two, uh, the BECCS could actually create negative emissions and which could expand carbon budget. And it may be possible that they could allocate more carbon budget to the fossil fuel sector so that their fossil, fossil fuel business could be carried on. 
So solution. And in the next slide, we could also see another solution. So uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so there's also the alternative solution, which is through plant conversions. So basically there are two types of conversion. The one is fuel switching, which means we could um, convert the more carbon intensive coal power plant to gas or biomass um, power plant. And for both cases, there are already successful projects that have been implemented uh, in the US, in the EU, and in Canada. And another option is the CCS retrofit. According to a report from the IEA in 2016, um, about 55% of the existing coal power plants in China are suitable for the CCS retrofit. So all of this look very promising. Um, however, um, next slide, please. Um, until now, so no study has rigorously analyzed whether these technologies could really prevent asset stranding in the power sector. Um, so in our analysis, um, we are going to address this research gap. And um, next slide. So in the, this slide, I showed you how we did this analysis to um, address this research question. So there are two types of data inputs we used in our paper. The first type is the global power plants, so which are used to estimate the current power plant's future production level. And we compiled the unit level um, power plant data from different um, global power plants um, databases. And then a second type of data input we used are climate scenarios, so which are used to model the pathways of electricity production that are required to attain the two degree target. And so we retrieve the scenarios from the Ampere project, uh, which is a modeling comparison project that uh, integrate um, that compiles the different climate scenarios from many different IAM models. And the main reason why we use this um uh why, why we retrieve scenarios from this project is because they model very different technology availabilities so as you can see here they have um, a set of climate scenarios and uh, some of them are assuming all the technologies will be fully deployed so the technology the technologies include ccs bioenergy nuclear and renewables and then they also have the single technology change scenarios. So which means they assume um, one of these technologies is not available. Then if we compare the amount of stranded assets between these pairwise scenarios, we could estimate the impact of the stranded assets, uh, in the impact of technologies on the amount of stranded assets. So in the next slide, um, I show you it's like how we did this by following a four step method. So for the time, uh, for the interest of time, I will not go into detail here. But one thing um, I want to highlight here is um, the way we measure stranded assets. So we measure it by the difference of future electricity production levels between the current plants and climate scenarios. So which means we measured it in an engineering term in petawatt hour of electricity production. We did not touch the financial side of this issue. So um, hopefully bearing this in mind could help you under, um, better understand our results. So in, then in the next slide, I'm going to show you our results. So this is our first result which is the estimates of future electricity generation. And you could see that we showed here our forecasted electricity generation from fossil fuel power plants uh, from this year to the end of this century. And we find there's about 540 petawatt hour of electricity that could be produced from the current operating 
and also um, the pipeline. And then we break it down by few and also by region. And on a few perspective, we see two thirds of um, it um, of the electricity are coming from coal power plants. One third is from um, gas power plants. Um, and on a regional perspective, we see about 60% of it will be coming from Asia, about 20% from um, OECD countries. And here, we also show one example of, um, of the scenarios that we used in our analysis. Um, so, um, which, are pre uh, which are presented by the dashed lines in the previous figure. Um, and then in this slide, we also show our estimates of the stranded assets. Um, so we see that here, um, the amount of stranded assets at the global level is around 270 um, petawatt hour of electricity that are risk of stranding. And just to uh, help you better understand this figure, so the bars, are representing the mean value across different models. Um, and then the individual scatters are the results from individual IAM models. So, so you could see the results from different IAM models really um, are really very different from each other. Um, but we showed here uh, the assumptions that all of these are based on the very optimistic assumption so that all the technologies are fully deployed. And we see, um, apart from the um, global level, then we break it down by region. And we see in the middle of the figure that um, about 50% of the stranded assets will be um, coming from Asia. And uh, um, in the last two um, columns, China and India are the two countries that will have most of the stranded assets. Um, so that's about uh, the result on our estimates of stranded assets based on the very optimistic assumption of technologies. And then in the next slide, uh, we show the impact of plant conversions. So um, here, what we show is if we assume a certain amount of um, power plants could be converted, then what is the change of the asset stranding compared to the baseline? So which is there is no conversion and the, the amount of asset stranding is 270, um, as I showed in the last figure. So you can see here, um, the CCS technology has the most potential um, as it could reduce asset stranding by up to 100 petawatt hour um, of electricity. And then the coal to biomass has a, um, has a least potential, which could only reduce asset stranding to uh, a maximum of 40 petawatt hour. So overall, all these options are showing that um, the plant conversions have some potential to reduce asset stranding, but the uh, impact is very limited. It cannot reduce asset stranding to zero. So in the next slide, um, we show our last result on the impact of technology availabilities. So as I mentioned earlier, all the previous results are based on the very optimistic ass assumption that all the technologies can be fully deployed. Then what we show here is what if one of the technologies is not available? Then what is the change of asset stranding compared to the baseline, the all technologies fully deployed scenarios? So we see here the CCS and bioenergy are the two technologies that have the most impact. As uh, if one of these technologies are not available, then the amount of asset stranding will be uh, increased by 68 or 44%. Um, and, and at the same time, renewables, nuclear, and energy intensity do not have a significant impact on the amount of asset stranding. So that's all on our results. And next slide, please. Uh, to conclude, 
we find that high, uh, there is high stranding risk even under very optimistic technology assumptions. Uh, in total, we find about 270 petawatt hour of uh, electricity that are risk of stranding. And to give you an idea of how big this figure is, it is about 10 times the global electricity generation in 2018. And we also find plant conversions have very limited impact. It, it could reduce um, the asset training to 170, but it cannot prevent it from happening. And the stranding may be 68 or 44% higher if CCS or bioenergy is not fully deployed. And we know this is very likely to be the case because of all the um, challenges that these two technologies are facing in their large scale deployment. So the um, next slide, which is the last slide to show our implications um, for this paper is that to answer the question whether these technologies could um, reduce asset stranding. Yes, they could. So that's why we should strongly push the development of these technologies. However, the asset stranding risk still remains substantial. Um, and um, that's why that stakeholders should act swiftly to minimize the stranding risk. For existing plants, they need to retire early or reduce utilization rates. And coal to gas remain as an option, but the impact is quite limited. And for those plants that are in the pipeline, uh, very little or no fossil fuel plants could be commissioned. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to any, any comments or questions you uh, might have. Many thanks, John Xiu. Um, as for the other sessions, we we'll leave questions for after all the presentations. So I would now like to ask Albert Roger from the ZEW Leibniz Center for European Economic Research to um, give us his talk about estimating technological gains and losses from international environmental agreement, the, st the case of stop pollutants. Albert, we cannot hear you. Sorry, now? Does it work? Okay, great. thanks. Yes, that's fine. So, Thank you. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Albert Roger, and uh, I am a PhD student at uh, CDV in Mannheim and at the University of Heidelberg. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm very happy to, uh, to give this talk. Today, I'm going to be presenting my work on estimating technological gains and losses from international environmental agreements, in particular, the case of stock pollutants. The next slide, please. Next, exactly. So we know that global environmental problems are engendered by stock pollutants, like uh, CO2 and ozone depleting substances. And uh, so far, the key regulatory instrument that we have in order to tackle global environmental ex externalities are international environmental agreements. Nevertheless, we know that uh, since those international environmental agreements have uncertain consequences, they often take long time to be negotiated. Therefore, quantifying the technological uh, economic impact of uh, an international environmental agreement would be key in order to reduce the uncertainty toward future agreements and maybe facilitate them. Nevertheless, this is a, a challenging task because stakeholders like firms might anticipate or delay the action. And uh, in that case, the uh, panel event studies might not be suited for uh, doing this quantification. And furthermore, uh, it would be hard to uh, try to derive a, a change in, in uh, a, an economic impact. So uh, the, the purpose of this paper is to develop a new method in order to quantify the technological gains and losses from an international environmental agreement. The next slide, please. So now I'm going to introduce you to the institutional framework. I am analyzing this paper, the Montreal Protocol, which is seen as the most successful international environmental agreement for phasing out stock pollutants. It was enacted in 1989 and aimed at phasing down and out some ozone depleting substances. It regulated many uh, types of substances, but mainly three families. 
the CFCs, the A CFCs, and the HFCs. So the original protocol enacted in 1989 uh, regulated the CFCs. Then the Copenhagen Amendment in 1992 uh, regulated the or aimed at phasing down the HFCs. And finally, the Kigali Amendment in 2016 uh, was the amendment for phasing down the H HFCs. So in this paper, I'm going to study the how the impact, the impact of the negotiations towards the Kigali Amendment in 2016 on patent value. The next slide, please. So now I'm going to present the data that I'm using in order to estimate the impact of the HFC negotiations on patent value. So first of all, I identify the HFCs that can be used as refrigerants from a refrigeration standard, the ANSIAR Shrai American Refrigeration Standard. And I also identify the clean substitutes uh, that can be used as refrigeration substances. I also identify which former uh, regulated substances under the Montreal Protocol can be used as refrigerants that are HCFCs or SCFCs. And with these substance names, I uh, identify uh, which patents mention those substances in their patent corpus. With this, I build my treatment groups, T1, which is uh, the patents that cite the HFCs, T2, that are, is a group that uh, cite the clean substitutes, and in the group T3, the uh, group that cites other types of substances. In order to build my control group, I take uh, the patents from the group T1 and find their technolog technological classes. And then I consider as my control group all the patents within those technological classes netted out of the patents of T1, T2, and T3. So the next slide, please. Exactly. Now I'm going to uh, first present some uh, panel event studies on, on, the, on the empirical evidence of uh, the shock of the HFC negotiations on patent value. So for this, uh, I first present the impact on uh, positively affected patents, that is on the patents of my group T2 or the substitutes. And I regress forward citations, which is a known, known uh, variable as a proxy for patent valuation on a set of lags and leads, uh, year fixed effects and two dummies, one dummy uh, for uh, controlling if a patent is active or not, and one dummy indicating the year of first publication. And we see that taking as in a baseline event 1996 and the event happening in 1997, there is a, there is a positive and a significant and increasing effect on patent value. The next slide, please. So now comparing, uh, doing the same, same exercise with the dirty technologies, we uh, don't find a, a significant effect. But we see that the confidence intervals are, are quite broad. And this could, uh, the reason for this could be that we are mixing types. That is that within the so-called dirty technologies, I am actually taking into account clean technologies. Uh, an example for this could be, for instance, a patent aiming at increasing the efficiency of some device using an HFC would be tagged as dirty patent, which is de facto a clean one. So uh, we see that the even if there is a positive effect, the negative effect is not clearly, uh, it's not easy to ad be identified. Uh, therefore, uh, we would need a further structure and I'm developing a structural model in order to, to be able to quantify these effects. The next slide, please. So uh, now I'm going to present uh, the structural model that I've developed. It builds upon the framework of the seminal model of PEX86 and the uh, later developments of Serrano 2018. And the intuition is that there is a patent holder that each period decides whether to renew or not a patent. And this patent holder can be in three states. In st as um, on the top left, um, he can be in state zero where he is not regulated and the policy, the environmental policy is not a hot topic in state one where the environmental policy is a hot topic. That is that stakeholders are discussing about this environmental policy or state two where she is, uh, the environmental policy is a hot topic and she thinks that she is regulated. Now the probability for changing from, from state zero to state one, that is that the policy becomes a hot topic depends on the probability PAT. That is a probability that is increasing across patent courts T 
and across patent ages A. As we can see on the graph on the right, where I've plotted the green curve uh, that shows this probability that increases over the years, and that around 2005 is more or less 50% uh, um, to 60%, this probability stems from a text count analysis, a text analysis, uh, taking the policy reports of the policy meetings from, of the Montreal Protocol, and uh, as I've plotted here, the, cumula the cumulative word counts for the HFCs. Now, the probability of becoming reg regulated, B, this probability, I, I don't know this probability, but I'm going to build counterfactuals on it. On the model itself, the decision of the agent depends on five state variables that are the current per period returns, XA, the per period returns in case that he would be regulated, YA, and three other state variables that show the, the three states. Sigma A, that is, if the agent is regulated, theta A, if he, he considers that he is in a hot um, um, policy state, and alpha A, that, if he, that shows if it, he was regulated the former period. Then if he renews a patent, he gets uh, the current per period returns XA and the discounted expected value after paying the uh, renewal fees CA. The per period returns XA evolve following a stochastic process where they get pre-multiplied from period to period by the variable random variable GEGI that stems from a, str a truncated distribution that is uh, the same one as in the paper of Serrano. And uh, the per period returns in case that he, he will be affected by the regulation are pre-multiplied by the variable um, random variable GE that stems from two truncated distributions depending on if the patent is affected positively or negatively. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to show some uh, results from the counterfactual analysis um, deduced from the uh, simulated method of moments uh, of my estimation. So here I'm showing the percentual change in present discounted value of the patents for different cohorts. That is, uh, I compare the patents of the treatment group, putting together uh, the patents in T1, that are the ones that mention the HFCs, and the patents in T2 that mention their substitutes, and comparing them to the patterns in the control group. It's important to notice, notice that the difference compared to the event studies is that here I am not saying, well, this is a clean pattern or this is a dirty pattern. I let the model capture the positive and the negative shocks. Okay, And here uh, I show the uh, simulation results where we can see that more or less on the, on the blue lines, we can see the positive impact and on the red lines, the, the negative impact. And we can see more or less that the positive impact ranges from about 4 to 40 percent and the negative impact from, from 9 up to 44 percent in present discounted value compared to the patterns in the control group. Next slide, please. Now to finish. Uh, in this paper, I found that uh, an the negotiations towards an international environmental agreement generated between 9 and 44 uh, percent economic losses, technological economic losses on dirty technologies, and that they generated between 4 and 40 percent technological economic gains on clean technologies. Uh, nevertheless, well, I, I have a large parameter space and I'm still doing robustness checks in order to certify that I've reached a global minimum. Therefore, the results of this estimation are probably are likely going to change in uh, the coming months. And in future versions of this paper, I will restrict the analysis only to uh, German patents. Thank you very much. Thanks, Albert. I would now like to introduce Federico Perillo of the University of Coimbra, who is going to talk about beyond efficiency contribution, be, uh, beyond the efficiency contribution, uh, decomposition analysis of the electricity intensity in the European Union. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Monica. Uh, I would like to thank you all the members of uh, University of Barcelona and also the members of this symposium. Uh, I'm waiting for my slides to begin my presentation. So, 
So this paper is uh, entitled Behind the Efficiency Contribution. This is a decomposition analysis of electricity intensity in European Union. Uh, this paper was developed uh, together with Professor Patricia Pereira da Silva and also Professor Pedro André Cerqueira. We are from the University of Coimbra, Portugal. Uh, if you can please go on. Uh, so this is the agenda of this presentation. I would like to introduce you this topic and then talking about uh, the motivation, the objectives and data that we used. Uh, then I'll go deeper on the methodology and the method that we, we chose for this uh, paper and then talk about the results, uh, the conclusion and some reference that we used. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So, uh, talking about energy policies and the main challenges that we deal with, uh, we are living in the current scenario of sustainable development and we have a clear need to balance uh, economic growth, energy consumption and also the exploitation of energy resources. And one of the main challenges that we are dealing with is to maintain the levels of economic productivity and reduce uh, energy resources input. So we want to produce more, uh, to, do, to be more economic productivity uh, and uh, to reduce our energy consumption. Uh, in this scenario, the electricity intensity is a key indicator uh, because it's a measure of efficiency in electricity consumption. Uh, based uh, on the literature, electricity intensity represents the ratio of electricity consumption to the GDP, so it's electricity consumption divided by GDP. And here in this graph, you can see uh, the, the electricity intensity behavior from 1995 to 2017 in the European Union. Uh, as you can see, we have a decrease of almost 40% in last uh, 22 years. But uh, as Losha said in 2015, uh, these figures, uh, these numbers does not represent nothing at all because uh, we have a lot of answers to, to a lot of questions to answer. Uh, so these numbers uh, by themselves, they are not meaningful at all. Uh, and the next slide, please. Uh, so why electricity intensity decomposition? Uh, we have a, a key motivations here. So the first one is because electricity intensity is not trivial. Uh, the analysis of this indicator uh, must be detailed, as I said before. Uh, the electricity intensity is also influenced by energy efficiency, but not only energy efficiency. We have many components that compose uh, this index. Uh, we are also living in a scenario that energy efficiency measures are becoming more important uh, and increasing day by day in the whole world. And we are also talking about a relevant topic that uh, was not detailed in the existing uh, literature before. On the next slide, I will keep talking about motivation. Uh, if we can go on, please. So we have some premises here. Uh, the first one is about uh, energy efficiency improvements that, uh, as I said before, are happening in a fast pace and are becoming more important day by day. And electricity is also assuming uh, an increasing share in the total final energy consumption. This figure shows uh, uh, the electricity uh, share in the final energy consumption in 2050. Uh, this is a figure uh, by the International Renewable Energy Agency. And as we can see, electricity will represent almost 50% uh, of our energy consumption in 2050. So energy efficiency and electricity are uh, uh, very important here to this paper. So the main objective of the, this paper was to decompose this index, so decompose electricity intensity in the European Union, and then evaluate the influence of its components. We wanted to, to answer some questions like, what are the components of electricity intensity? How have these components behaved in the European Union? and the actual impact of energy efficiency, what's the real impact of energy efficiency in electricity intensity. 
And to do this, we used uh, data extracted from Eurostat, so the official database from European Union. We used uh, data from energy consumption, electricity consumption, and also activity level, so economic data uh, and electricity intensity by itself. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the methodology that we use, so the strategy that we went on. So the first thing that we did was to define the methodology and the methods that we want to use. And then we also want to define the components of electricity intensity. So we have a big brainstorm here to understand what is electricity intensity and what are the components that influence in this index. And then uh, we are here in this upgraded decomposition analysis. This is innovative to the best of your knowledge because the other electricity intensity decompositions just considered two components uh, in its composition. And here we considered three different components. So the structure component is the first one. Uh, it represents the economic activity of uh, European Union. Then the efficiency component that represents uh, the efficiency by itself, so less uh, energy consumption, electricity consumption. And then the electrification component, uh, as we saw before, the electricity is becoming more important in the final energy consumption. Uh, and after that, we just divide the, these database in four different cycles based on European Commission energy efficiency measures to see how they relate with these uh, directives of, uh, from European Union. Uh, move on to the next slide, please. We are talking about uh, the method that we chose. So uh, we work with the LMDI method. This is a very diversified method and very used on the decomposition of intensity index analysis. And here, uh, as I said before, we just split that uh, this index, the electricity intensity index in three different components. So S for structure, F for efficiency, and the K for electrification. Uh, move on to the results. Uh, I would like to show you here, this is the main figure of your pap our paper. So uh, the yellow color here represents electrification. The blue color represents the structure component. Uh, the origin color represents the efficiency component. And the gray color represents the total uh, electricity intensity index. Uh, and moving on to talking about these results on next slide, uh, uh, I will talk to about uh, this, these results and some discussion. So as we can see, um, the three companies have had completely different behaviors here, as we saw on the on this graph. Uh, the efficiency represented by the orange color and the structure represented by the blue color elements contributed to the reduction of uh, electricity intensity because they were uh, below one. So uh, they, they contributed to the reduction of the decrease of this index. And the electrification element was the only element or the only component that contributed to the increase of this index because uh, it was uh, above one uh, on the database. So the main things that we can hear uh, extract from these results is uh, the first one, if there have been no changes in structural and efficiency components, I just say that if we consider that electrification is the only component of uh, electricity intensity, we would have an increase of 26% of uh, electricity intens intensity in European Union, just uh, considering the electrification variation. On the other hand, if we consider that we had been no changes in structural and electrification component, as just say, if we consider that efficiency was the only component acting on this indicator on uh, this database, we would have a reduction of 48%, almost 49% in electricity intensity in European Union, exclusively due to uh, efficiency improvements. So the efficiency, efficiency component here was uh, very significant. On next slide, 
I would like to talk about the distinction by country uh, that, that we did here. So an interchange of countries was signif significantly evidenced in, in, in these components, but no standard behavior stood out to generate a relevant conclusion. So we have a mix of uh, results here. Uh, we can move on to see the figures that I put on this slide, please. Um, uh, we can move on. Yes, this is the structure component represented by blue color. So we have a, a, a like a mix of uh, these countries here. And then moving on, we will see uh, the other components, efficiency and electrification. Uh, if you could please uh, move on. Yes, this is the efficiency uh, component that we have, like uh, the top 10 countries represented on the left side and uh, the other countries represented on the, the right side. And then the, the last component was the electrification. If we can move on, we will see that we all, all, all have a different uh, behavior here. Um, if you can please uh, change the slide. Yes, this is the electrification component. As we can see, almost uh, the, the majority of countries in the European Union were above one, so they contributed to the increase of electricity intensity component. Uh, moving on to our conclusions, so next slide, uh, please. Um, uh, the main outcome of this, this paper was the energy efficiency played a crucial role in reducing electricity intensity. So efficiency is very important uh, to reduce electricity intensity and its real impact proved to be more relevant than we expected before uh, this research and this paper. So efficiency is more relevant than we expect. Uh, this index, so the electricity intensity will decrease more if uh, we consider only changes in the efficiency component. Uh, the structural factor, so the structural element, displayed minor influence because uh, even though it, it, the economic activity profile of European Union has changed in this database period, uh, it was a minor influence component. And then the, the electrification component has almost always contributed to increase the electricity intensity indicator. So electrification, uh, of course, are uh, in, uh, contributing to increase the electricity intensity. And finally, in the last slide uh, of this presentation, we can move on, please. Uh, uh, the main contributions that we thought for this paper was uh, first one, first topic, the, the real impact of efficiency and the other components, electrification and uh, structural component. And uh, the main novelty of this paper was the electrification component introduction. Uh, it proved to be relevant uh, because the results uh, that we found here are different from other decompositions that we found on the literature. And finally, uh, going deeper on the future work opportunities, so research avenues, this methodology can be applied in other countries, just re restricted to data availability. Uh, we also have the opportunity to relate these decomposition components to other economic variables like uh, electricity prices or uh, other economic variables uh, related to the energy world. And finally, we can also associate res these results with some another analysis of European Commission um, directives. This combination uh, will definitely intensify this paper and this presentation analysis and uh, maybe guide for future public policies in the energy sector. Uh, next slide, I just put my references, the references that we use. And on the next slide, uh, I would like to thank you again, uh, all the members of this symposium and members of University of Barcelona. Thank you. Many thanks, Frederico. Um, we have about a bit more than uh, 10 minutes before our break. Uh, so I will keep it to just one question um, to each of the speakers. Uh, started with uh, Yang Xiu. Um, given that this session is um, focusing on policy and regulation, um, would you uh, suggest um, 
possibly one policy that might help uh, promoting or um, making sure that the most efficient technologies are selected when we're considering plan conversions towards that the sort of um, um, a reduction in in uh, uh, stranded asset problems as you're suggested in, in in your presentation yeah um thanks monica that's a very good question um so i think based on the results from our analysis we see that CCS and bioenergy are really the two technologies that can um, play a significant role in reducing the amount of stranded assets. Um, and we know um, for both CCS and bioenergy, um, in terms of the large scale development of these two technologies, they are, uh, they are facing a lot of challenges. So I think uh, the most important um, policy implication from this paper would be um how could we better design the policies to um accelerate the deployment and development of these two technologies and especially um is there any way to have an uh, um any um i mean it's like in, in terms of the, the technology breakthrough um i think these two technologies are already like technically um available so they are quite developed at the technical level. But then the problem is how could we really um, put them into use at a large scale? So I think the most important policy would be to um, design to increase, to accelerate the large scale deployment of um, either CCS or bioenergy. Like for CCS, I, um, there are some pilot or demonstration projects, but we know there are still very far from um, being used um, on a large commercial scale. So I think for countries, um, we should really think how could we um, better motivate the development of um, CCS and bioenergy. M many thanks. It's the most, most useful uh, recommendation. And uh, moving on to, to Albert then, I, I was wondering whether beyond international agreements, if we're looking at um, regulation, uh, maybe in a more structural way, would there be suggested changes to patent laws or patent arrangements that could uh, promote uh, more technological efficient options? Well, I think that, um, thank you very much, first of all, for the question. Uh, I think that where there is room for improvement is regarding uh, process innovations. Like patent system uh, works very well for product innovations, but we know that for process innovations, uh, it might not be that straightforward and many firms go for trade secrets. And therefore, I think that where there is room for improvement, uh, such that firms um, like patent those uh, process innovations or energy efficient process innovations, uh, like there is room for improvement for, for giving incentives uh, for firms for doing that. Either uh, like a public support would be, would be important in that case. Thank, thank you very much, Albert. Uh, and, and then uh, moving on to Frederico, then um, I was wondering about um, the existence of a European policy which is, uh, has been labeled as energy efficiency first. Um, given your contribution, would you suggest any changes to this approach or what other recommendation would you have for the Commission in trying to promote uh, the choice of more energy efficient uh, technologies and behaviors. Okay, thank you, Monica, for your question. Uh, this is a very good question. Um, I would say that the European Union and the uh, European Commission are doing well. Uh, we can see uh, that the directives that are, are becoming uh, implemented are, are are having some good results. Uh, the only thing that I want to wonder here and uh, to question them 
uh, is about uh, the use of energy uh, data and not electricity data. As we saw in our study, uh, electricity is becoming more important and more relevant day by day. So uh, most of times the European Union uh, studies and directives just consider energy consumption. And I think that now it's time to look forward uh, electricity consumption and do this distinction by uh, energy and electricity because we are becoming more electrificated uh, uh, day by day. So uh, the only thing that I would say that is uh, maybe we can consider more electricity instead of energy. But uh, uh, the, the directives and, uh, and the plans from the European Union are doing, are doing well. Thank you very much, Federico. I I'm afraid I I didn't seem to be able to see questions from the chat box. It might be that I don't have the appropriate uh, access, but uh, all the questions that have come through the chat box will be passed on to the presenters. Um, so, given that we have just a few minutes before we can. Uh, have a break and then listen to Natalia's key and note speech. Uh, I would like to conclude this session by maybe summarizing the contributions, which have highlighted the fact that there are uh, technological uh, um, improvements that are available, that markets and, and industry are uh, moving very fast in, in this environment, uh, developing new ways of uh, uh, produce, producing energy and doing it more efficiently. And as we've heard from the feedback um, from our um, presenters today, uh, there is an important role for policymakers and regulators to support um, an effective development of these technologies so that um, a sort of a, a more efficient and uh, um, low carbon uh, system can be uh, determined and, and implemented at the international level, uh, particularly in light of all the positive um, signals and contributions that we are hearing about a determination of policymakers to, um, to to develop beyond the COVID crisis uh, using uh, green policies and, and green and, and in particular for Europe a green new deal so there is a space in policy for uh, making sure that the recovery is guided by uh, low carbon uh, objectives. I believe uh, we could uh, close the session here. I would like to thank the presenters and the organization uh, from the uh, University of Barcelona for um, their contribution to a very smooth uh, session. And um, I believe we are going to resume with the keynote speech at uh, uh, five minutes past uh, uh, one European times. So it's, it's an hour earlier for me. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to uh, the next uh, session of the, of the symposium.